Welcome to On the Issues. I'm Councilman Jim Waring. And joining me on today's show is one of my colleagues serving in District 1 on the Phoenix City Council, Councilwoman Ann O'Brien. And thanks so much for joining us on the show. Well, I really appreciate you inviting me, Jim. Well, we're looking forward to this conversation. <laughs> and I really wanted to focus on your role as chair of the Public Safety Committee. But first, I thought our viewers, you know, we're, our districts are right next to each other, divided by I-17 in North Phoenix. But not everybody watches this show or knows who they're Phoenix City Council person is, so I'm sure there are a lot of constituents of mine who don't know my, who I am, and that I'm sure they don't know all the rest of my colleagues as well. So I thought this might be a good chance for you to introduce yourself to them because you vote on issues that are of concern to them, of course, whether it's zoning cases or citywide public policy. So I know you served eight years on a school board, uh, and then you ran uh, for the Phoenix City Council a few years ago. Um, frankly, you present as smarter than that, so tell us why you took leave of your senses and decided to run for office. <laughs> well, honestly, I love serving my community. I was born and raised in Phoenix mm -hmm. and have lived um, most of my life in the district I represent in District 1. So I get to represent uh, what I believe to be the best district in the city and I do it because I love it and I care about it and it's my home. Well, I got to know you a little bit when you were you were on the school board, which is, is really, you know, it's it's tough duty because of budget concerns and teacher shortages and so forth. So I know that was a, a lot of hard work and we were grateful when you stepped up uh, to fill the role when, when Thelda Williams was term limited. We just lost Thelda a few weeks ago, so that was a big loss for the city. But uh, but you jumped right in and obviously we're very aware with your history and of the issues. Now, I believe you have uh, Phoenix uh, civil servants in your family, correct? Uh, I do. I'm, my dad is a retired Phoenix fire after 30 years. He's been retired about 15 years now, so I, I grew up in the firefighter family. Mm -hmm. And uh, my brother-in-law is a police detective with Phoenix Police Department. Additionally, my sister works in the crime lab. Uh, she just was in DNA and, and now works in evidence screening. So yes, uh, City of Phoenix is near and dear to my heart. Uh, as well are, are those agencies. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, it's, it's just fantastic that you have all that public service in, in one family. I think that's amazing. Uh, and, you know, really have enjoyed working with you. We serve on public safety together. I'm going to jump right into the sort of the, the pressing issue of the day, and then maybe we'll work backwards from there. But the Department of Justice investigation, we've talked about that and other issues, obviously, but, but we've talked a lot about where that stands and so forth. Uh, within the bounds of our executive privilege conversations, you know, can you tell us your thoughts and where you think things are going from here? So the Department of Justice, as you know, has been here since August mm -hmm. of 2021. So we're getting really close to, I believe, the 29th mar month mark of this investigation. Um, over 140,000 documents have been provided, over 20,000 um, body-worn camera videos. So it, it just has been an all-encompassing investigation, and we have fully cooperated with the Department of Justice. Um, and spending a fortune to do it. I was just going to say, 5.5 plus million, so and counting. Um, we've received additional requests from the Department of Justice as late as this past Friday. So although folks have been telling me that the, the signs of a, an investigation wrapping up are the interviews with folks like the city manager or the chief of police. Um, those happened a while ago and they're still making requests. So I'm a, a little bit wary of that old it's wrapping up conversation. <laughs> <laughs> and the dollars, as you say, are, are racking up. And honestly, when you look at the stats of other cities who have gone into a consent decree with the Department of Justice, whether that was voluntarily or not. Um, the data does not show the good things come from that. Uh, for example, New Orleans and Portland, their violent crime rates have risen over 55% since the Department of Justice has been in their backyard. So it's just not, um, in my opinion, the best thing for us. Do I want to hear what they have to say? Absolutely. But am I interested in turning over the reins of the Phoenix Police Department as well as the City of Phoenix budget to the Department of Justice and a monitor and a federal judge? No. Well, you summed it up very ably there. I, I always find it sort of helpful if you could take your public policy issue and try to put it on a bumper sticker. So for <laughs> me, this is, uh, if I had to put it on something as small as that, I'd say, this is a great opportunity for you, taxpayer, to spend a lot more money to be a lot less safe. And who would vote for that if that's how you, you really framed it? But that's been the experience 
of our sister cities uh, and our own uh, Maricopa County Sheriff, who is, rumor has it, leaving his job in part because of his experience with the Justice Department. Uh, from what I've observed, when they tell you they're investigating you, they're basically assuming we're taking over and you're gonna pay for the privilege for the next 10, 12 years from start to finish. Right. Um, it's really crazy. So we've been trying to navigate that on public safety, but your thoughts on maybe what comes next? Oh, so what should come next, right, from the Department of Justice mm -hmm. is a releasing of their findings. Our, <sighs> our consultant has asked them to pr provide us with a 14-day review period so that we can ensure that the facts are correct in their findings because as other cities before us have found, they weren't always correct. Uh, the, Shocking, I yeah. know. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I know you, you find that uh, <laughs> shocking. So it, essentially what they're going to do is, they, they've now said to us officially in writing that they will not give us that 14-day review period. Um, so they will provide their findings to the city and to the country and, and tell everybody what they think of us. And afterwards, then we will have an opportunity Washington to Washington leaking it. being what it is, I'm sure we'll probably read about it in the newspaper before we actually get some sort of official documents. Yes, unlike um, some of our sister cities, the city of Phoenix, we have to vote. Uh, the city of council, city council will have to vote what our next steps are. In other cities, the mayor or city manager has had the opportunity to just sign off on what they call that agreement in principle. And we don't have that opportunity here, which I'm very thankful for because it's important for all the council members to be fully knowledgeable on what their findings are. But it's also important for us to, to fact check that information um, and for our citizens to be able to weigh in on what our next steps are. No, it's, it's, it's a frustrating process. I mean, I wasn't obviously as familiar with it uh, before we were in it. And it is kind of shocking the way this has been rolled out other places. Uh, and that I guess we would theoretically be expected to vote without really even having a chance to review the thing, more or less, uh, given their timeline. So that's, uh, that's a, a non-starter for me. And I've said very publicly that I don't care what they come up with. I recognize that nobody's perfect, but I'm not signing off on having them take over. I actually think it'll make uh, constituents in my district and around the city less safe. Um, we're already having problems, as we'll hopefully discuss in a second, uh, with, with police hiring. So maybe you could talk a little bit about some of the potential ramifications uh, for what goes forward, given morale and department and, and other issues that maybe aren't directly addressed by the Department of Justice, but will almost certainly be affected by it. Well, I was fortunate enough for um, Sheriff Penzone to invite me over to meet with his staff and with himself to discuss what they have been experiencing, experiencing since he's been in office. Um, he, as you said, is not finishing his term. He's leaving his elected office uh, at the end of this year and taking a new position. It was incredibly enlightening to hear what they are going through uh, with the county sheriff's department. Essentially, they have more people investigating deputies than they have investigating crimes. I don't know how that makes our citizens safer. In addition, the, the bar for success is three years uh, at 94% achievement of whatever those goals are under the court order. However, he was ex sharing with me that the monitor went back and retroactively uh, undid some of those numbers. And so while they had met the three-year bar, then they went in and said, no, we've changed our mind on these cases and took them all the way down to, I believe it was 13% on some of their um, areas of improvement. And so again, that just doesn't make sense for the citizens of Phoenix to have a whole lot of cost going into um, not making them safer. So. Yeah, well, it, it's, I mean, it's a huge chunk of our budget it's almost a billion dollars that we spend on public safety. There's a reason. It is one of the main, if not the main component of city government. And frankly, why governments were created in the first place was the safety of citizens. So anything that demonstrably, to my mind, in other cities has made citizens less safe, while also escalating costs, uh, is just, it just doesn't make any sense whatsoever. However, even if we refuse, you know, they could fight us on this, 
for, for years, literally for maybe a decade. Right, they could take us to court and we could end up there fighting it. However, while we are fighting that, we would still at least be in charge yeah. of our police department as well as our budget. One of the other things that I got to talk with Sheriff Penzone about in his team is that they can do, do no special operations without specific approval from both the monitor and the judge. So some of the task force that we've stood up here in the city of Phoenix, like for the 19th Avenue and 27th Avenue corridors, we wouldn't be able to do the, that without permission. Um, Sheriff Penzone shared that you know the town of Guadalupe uh, has had a, a significant crime increase since the Department of Justice has, has been in Maricopa County's business. They can't do anything about it because it would be considered a significant operation and they would need special approval to do that. Well, the committee you chair, public safety, we've been addressing the officer shortage. Mm. We budgeted for, I believe the number is 3,125 officers, which is still short of the all-time high, which was more like 33, 3,400. Right. Uh, that was a while ago, but, mm -hmm. but still, the city was smaller, so you had more per capita officers. And now we're down to running in the range of about 2,500, 2,550. You know, you want to talk about some of the steps that I know you personally worked on to try to get officers involved, uh, or more, I guess, more people more excited about coming to work for the Phoenix Police Department. So one of the things that we've changed is it used to be that the background checks were all done manually. If you can believe in this day and age of technology, the Phoenix Police Department was still doing that all manually and hand walking paper through the steps. So we've changed to a new system so that now background checks can be done in days rather than in months. So that was a huge uh, step to getting folks into the door. Additionally, um, along with myself and you and our fellow council members, we voted to increase pay for our, our uh, Pretty officers. Pretty dramatically. Very actually. dramatically. So now they have the opportunity to be the highest paying in the state of Arizona. So th that is huge. Um, and for veterans, it really incentivized staying a couple more years. If you were just about to leave, this gave you an incentive to stay because retirement was a big issue for us. It wasn't just the recruiting. Absolutely. The, the folks leaving, yeah, that was huge. Then the state offered us an opportunity. So now the city can approve two more years um, in the drop program for folks, which speaks to your retention issue. So we've done some things and we're partnering with folks. We've got some partners with partnering with ASU, U of A, GCU, NAU to do some recruiting there. So those are all very exciting um, opportunities as well as with um, the veterans uh, organizations for folks who are coming out of the military. Right. And we've authorized other positions to sort of offload some of the, you didn't really need a gun on your hip to be doing it type of work, investigative work and so forth, trying yes. to bring, bring back some retirees on a part-time basis. But it's been, it's been tough going. We've had some successes with it and try to get more officers out on the street. Yeah, we definitely, uh, as you know, we've had some problems just talking about our traffic unit, mm -hmm. right? Some folks were upset with us about raising speed limits or lowering speed limits in areas and they, they thought we were gonna set up speed traps. Well, as you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny when you have 39 officers for 5,000 miles of streets, you're gonna have to work hard to stumble into a speed trap. Yes, if you got caught speeding, then you were either going way, way too fast or it was really your unlucky day. <laughs> well, and that's why you see the extreme speeding. That you, it's mm -hmm. not everybody. Right. You know, most people are still driving. Maybe they're taking an extra five miles, something that wouldn't have got you pulled over by a motorcycle officer in years gone by. But now people are very aware that we only have, maybe they don't know the numbers, of course, but right. 39 officers <laughs> for 5,000 miles. They know the chances that they're going to get caught, even if they're doing 70 and a 40, is pretty minimal. And I'm not trying to advertise, hey, every speeder out here might be watching the show, go ahead and do it. It's just a reality that people have picked up on this and mm -hmm. just like markets everywhere, the speeder market is doing well and it's booming. And the only way to combat that, it's not to put stationary cameras or anything really, it's to have like, hey, there might be an officer right around that corner. You know, I gotta, you know, if, if people know where different apparatuses are, that's one thing, but you have to have that variability. Like there was an officer that last week, maybe he's there, I can't go 70. And we just don't have the, the person power, the officer power to do it um, because they gotta respond to crimes in progress. Absolutely, we need to fill those spots that we have. And, and I know that this is the first year 
where we are we will have hired more folks than have reti have retired mm -hmm. from the department. So I am thrilled that we're taking those positive steps. I was just looking at some numbers, and we will actually have some. We have some classes that are in the upper 30s uh, for our academy classes. So we're running classes every eight weeks, which was a nod to how they were reorganizing them before they could wait months before they got into a class. Uh, additionally, we're working in the, uh, with our police assistant program, so if you're too young to become a police officer, we'll find you a spot there so that you can learn about the organization prior to you being able to test into the department. If memory serves, you can't go to the academy to 20 and a half, uh, so then you do six months and then by 21 you'd be uh, a full-fledged officer, at least officer in training, uh, but it is... Um, it is concerning, I think the last meeting we had where we actually had a presentation about this, I think the quick math in my head showed that it was gonna take 12 and a half years just to get up to the 31,000, or, or 3,100, excuse me, that, that we need. Um, so it's moving in the right direction, but we need to accelerate. So if you're watching at home and you're young and you're interested in this kind of work, you know, we're gonna make this as good an opportunity for you as we can. A absolutely, and, and whether you're young or maybe middle-aged, you yeah. should still consider it. it. It's a great organization. Additionally, we depend a lot upon our reserve officers, mm -hmm. and so if you want to do it in a volunteer capacity, uh, that training they do over a year, and it allows you to assist our officers in a, a multitude of ways. So mm -hmm. we are fortunate to have that um, branch of the Phoenix Police Department as well. And if you are in the reserve, some of the retirees stay in uh, just from you know, public spiritedness, but also it, it keeps their, uh, some of their statuses. So, you know, they're a little still active. So that, that would be a great opportunity for people. I know people like that. Mm -hmm. I work out at the gym. He really wanted to be a Phoenix officer and he was in the reserves, I think for four years, when, back in the day when we weren't doing academies all the time. Uh, it was his dream and right. he's, he's loved every minute of it. I just saw him the other day. I always check, see how he's doing. He's excited. I've done a ride along with him. Um, but uh, he really loved the reserve program. Yeah. You know, as a younger person, he, he got a lot out of that. So it's something that, if you're watching at home, again, sorry to make this a recruiting pitch, but <laughs> we, we kind of we need to. And, you know, we're going to try to do better about being more positive about the department at the council meetings, too, because it was pretty negative for a while. I know when you started, the things people were saying were really kind of off the wall, and we got a dose of that at our last council meeting as well. We did, unfortunately, get a dose of that uh, last meeting. Our, People who think it'll be better if we had no police. Yes, and... They are not as cognizant of the crime statistics in other cities as apparently we are. <laughs> or in our own city, yeah. right? It's important to enforce our laws and do it um, in a manner that is good for all of us. Yeah. We can't have a lawless society, and I understand that there are other problems the city needs to address, but keeping our um, families and our visitors safe has to be number one for the council. And I know since I've been on, there has been a change of attitude. And I, I hope our men and women who are on the streets and in the uniform understand that we do support them and we know we need them. So that's important to me. And proving not every person, even people who are trying to pay attention and so forth, are cognizant of everything that's going on in the city of Phoenix. I get a lot of questions about people driving on the 17 saying, what are all those cranes over there? So they are <laughs> over there in District 1. It is the Taiwan Semiconductor Plant. Uh, you want to run us through, I'm jealous that it's in the other side of I-17, but obviously we've had a lot of development in, in North Phoenix, both on your side of the 17 and, uh, and mine, if I can call it that. Uh, you know, people uh, are gonna need places to live who are working at that plant, but you wanna talk about some of the incredible statistics about oh. that economic development uh, well, I'm not sure you, right, you know, I'm not sure there's more than say, right, a 40, yeah. $40 billion investment in North Phoenix will, will bring so much. Um, the numbers of companies that have relocated, or not relocated, but expanded mm -hmm. to North Phoenix, whether it's District 1 or District 2, to support the TSMC is really incredible. Um, we're so excited. State Land Trust is looking at a, a land sale, sale because now we need more mm -hmm. homes. Um, and more opportunities for just that live, work, play, and it's definitely coming to where you and I are. <laughs> and the average salary is up there six figures, I think, pretty much across the boards. 
Yes, and we're thankful to the universities who are helping to support uh, making sure we have the workforce available for TSMC and all of those that are here to support TSMC. Well, when your groundbreaking attracts the United States, sitting United States president and Apple CEO <laughs> and so forth, it's, I think you were there as well. So they, yes. got, they got all three of the big, most important heavy hitters. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm sure the mayor was there as well, uh, Absolutely. but, uh, but yeah, it, it's, it's really a, a spectacular, um, uh, feat for our economic development folks, but also for you personally, uh, given that it is in the area you represent. Yeah, I'm very excited. I have, have, have a lot of great, um, assets in district one folks don't realize it given, um, our city, but in addition to, I have ASU West's campus, we have the Deer Valley airport, um, as well as the Metro Center redevelopment, uh, coming. So, it's exciting time in District 1, and, and we're looking forward to revitalizing some of those areas as well as just the, the new growth that's coming, like I said, mm -hmm. uh, up north next to you. Yeah, and strangely, you mentioned redistricting, so I'll touch on that. Yes. We just went through redistricting. We now have 2,001 or 201,000 people in, uh, in each of our districts, roughly. Yes. Um, you know, those are pretty big districts. But I think your district didn't change at all. Is that correct? It did not change at all. Yeah. We were very close to being just right. As mm -hmm. I said, some districts were too big, some were too small, but District 1 was just right. Yep. Yep. <laughs> so we, I was... uh, we lost 7,000 uh, <laughs> citizens in uh, District 2 because we had grown a little more than the average. So uh, these things uh, fluctuate over time. There wasn't as much growth in North Phoenix as there had been in the past. Right. Obviously, you know, it's expensive to build up there on either side mm -hmm. of our shared borders. So, you know, obviously, when people look at, at District 2 or District 1, it's, it's gonna be more expensive to build a single family home. It's gonna be more expensive. You're gonna have to charge more rent if you're building an apartment or a mm -hmm. condo. So you wanna talk about that a little bit because it is an issue. And so subsequently you're seeing development in other parts of the city right. uh, at a greater rate than you had in the past. So there are some cycles, right? When I came into office, we were having a lot of for rent product coming mm -hmm. to District 1. Um, which we're excited to have because predominantly the way the city has grown, uh, you see the, the density to be in downtown and then we, the sprawl out through the rest of the districts and, and District 1 is, is no different. So we're, we're excited to have some of that density up in District 1 um, in a way that hopefully is affordable to some of our families. We've had to work with the school district so that they could redo their numbers. They kept saying, well, we only get this many kids out of apartments. And I'm like, you've got to readjust that because families are moving to apartments to be in the north part of Phoenix. Additionally, we're working hard with developers to make sure we offer a variety of products so that we can maybe bring back shared wall products, townhomes, condos, uh, row homes, uh, and bring down some of those costs so we can have homes for those folks who are first-time buyers, mm -hmm. um, as well as all those in between. So working hard with the developers, legislators, and uh, the city to make that happen. Well, and it does when it, makes, when it gets harder for, for the younger buyer to get in. Like in District 2, we have Paradise Valley uh, School District. They just closed, I think it was four more schools, uh, just at a meeting a couple of weeks ago. I think that's maybe seven in the last decade or so. Uh, you know, that's a lot of public infrastructure that's not being uh, completely utilized. They are renting out the space for different purposes, or trying to anyway, but they've dropped from 33,000 kids down to I think 26,000. So when you lose 7,000 kids, and that's one of the consequences when it's really expensive. Mm -hmm. I can't believe the home prices um, for, for homes that are then bulldozed even in my own neighborhood. I have an empty lot now right across the street from me where two generations of the same family had lived, lived for decades, I think since the 50s, and now that home is gone. So it's just it's something that we're seeing that, that usually Phoenix had been very affordable in the past, mm -hmm. and it still is compared to you know New York or San Francisco or Seattle or something. But uh, it's not as affordable as it used to be, for sure. No, it is not as affordable as it used to be. But, and we as a city, I think, know that we have a housing shortage and are working uh, diligently to make sure we, we have some of those other options so that we don't price out to that new um, home buyer and, and can bring back some of those families. I guess one of the advantages of being uh, such a great city to live in, right, is families don't move out. When mm -hmm. families grow up, 
the moms and dads don't necessarily move on. I know that you know we still live in the house that we raised our kids in, and I love my neighborhood and don't really want to move, but uh, I can also see the school from my driveway. So right. we're, not, we're not helping the school situation, right. but. Well, and that's a national phenomenon. Mm -hmm. I think the average age to move into a retirement facility is now 82. So the baby boomer generation, you know, a few years older than us, uh, not as many years as I would like, but a few years older than us, uh, they, they have not been selling their homes, to your point. And I think we're kind of following their lead. So yes, right. you are getting some, uh, we had three generations of Waring's living in my house. Uh, my father lived with us until he passed. So you had three Jim Waring's actually all living under one roof, which is probably three too many. <laughs> A lot of people watching the show. But, you know, that you, you are seeing more of that than you had in decades. But you're not seeing enough of it to make up for a 7,000 student loss. Right. Um, I mean, it's just... It's so unfortunate. I hadn't, I hadn't heard that they had closed mm -hmm. their schools. Mm -hmm. um, another, it just happened more, last week. Yeah. That's so sad, but I hope this revitalization with the with TSMC and the other companies that are coming and working hard to to bring in those new homes will be able to revitalize our school districts and make sure that the kids have good options. And and with your experience on a school board for mm -hmm. I think it was eight years uh, in the Deer Valley School District, you want to talk about school safety? I'm a parent. I have kids who are in school. They're in school right this minute. Uh, obviously, if you're a parent and you're not at least somewhat thinking about what could happen, not saying it will, obviously, right. but what could happen, then you're not paying attention. So I know that was probably something you addressed as a school board member. You want to give us your thoughts on kind of where things stand with such a pressing public policy issue? So I think it's really important for parents and um, administrators and the community to be involved in those decisions that should be made at a local level and which we did in Deer Valley and um, we had five high schools three junior highs and um, most of them had police officers which is very important it, I think it's a great way for kids to connect with and learn about what what goes on in their community that police officers are there for for good um, I know it's hard to believe given the statistics or you know the stories we see, but children are still incredibly safe in their schools. But things are happening, and so having an officer is important. As you said earlier, it's a struggle though for the Phoenix Police Department right now, given that we're down about 500 to 550 positions. If an officer's at the school, they're not answering they're not burglary ans calls. Yes, yeah. they're not answering a different kind of call. So. You know, we're working hard um, right now, again, working with uh, the Arizona D Department of Education and some other cities who would like to um, pass some legislation to make it possible for our officers, our retired officers, to come back and work as SROs. So that would be incredibly helpful to our numbers if we could have that option. Yeah, and I, I lose track. I've been, I've been to a, a lot of council meetings over the years. Uh, I can't remember if you were there when people were actually protesting about having police officers in certain school districts, which is kind of hard to believe now in uh, this climate. But that was a real thing a couple of years ago. The schools were rejecting the idea that they should have an officer. Yeah, I was not on the council then. However, mm -hmm. I do remember it vividly because I was at Deer Valley Unified School District. And while our um, community did not feel that way, again, Local control is important, but I think you have to have all the information and and understand the role of an officer. And some schools weren't using our officers, I shouldn't say our Phoenix officers, but weren't using the officers in a proper manner. They're there for all of the school and protect them from certain instances, but they're not there for discipline. Mm -hmm. So we've come a long way since then, and I'm glad to see it turn around where communities are welcoming officers back into their schools to develop those positive relationships with kids and to keep them safe. Yeah. Well, Anne, Councilwoman O'Brien, I know you're going to be shocked to hear this, but our time is almost up. And I really appreciate you doing this. I told you it would fly by, so hopefully it did for you. But, uh, but really appreciate you doing this. I, I think the audience will get a lot out of your insights from both your school service and your service as a public safety chair. So I really can't thank you enough for being here. I hope you have a wonderful holiday season. And if you have any questions or comments, please call my office at 602-262-7445 or visit my website, phoenix.gov slash district two. And we look forward to seeing you next time. Bye.